In the summer of 2019, CBS premiered Blood and Treasure, a globe-trotting action-adventure series about an intrepid international lawyer and a cunning art thief who team up to catch a ruthless terrorist. With 2.7 million viewers, the show was a hit and will be back for a second season in a few months. The exciting action drama was inspired by the real-life adventures of a group of international lawyers who hopscotch around the globe working on war crimes prosecutions, human rights cases, and peace negotiations. They say that truth is sometimes more exciting than fiction. In this broadcast of WCPN's Talking Foreign Policy, we'll talk to four international lawyers whose actual adventures may have helped inspire the hit show right after the news. Who doesn't love a great action-adventure TV series? In the summer of 2019, millions tuned into the show Blood and Treasure to see if a brilliant international lawyer and a cunning international art thief could stop a deadly terrorist. Two years earlier, my colleague Mark Vlaskich, a former war crimes prosecutor and law professor, told me that he had pitched the idea for the show to CBS. Quote, it's a story of international lawyer as action hero, a combination of Perry Mason and Indiana Jones, end quote, he told the studio. Not only did CBS greenlight the project, but it even hired Mark to serve as one of the executive producers. The show was a hit and the second season will launch in a few months. Unfortunately, Mark couldn't join us today because he's on a plane to Europe. But for this broadcast, I've assembled four international lawyers, all friends of Mark's, whose real-life adventures may have helped inspire the series. Welcome to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. In this broadcast, our panel of international lawyers will be sharing their real-life adventures on the four corners of the globe. We'll hear about the challenges and the dangers that they encountered in their important work bringing war criminals to justice, stopping human rights violations, and negotiating peace agreements. Our guests today are all affiliated with the Public International Law and Policy Group a non-governmental organization that I co-founded 24 years ago and which was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. The group has provided legal counsel in 15 peace negotiations. It's helped establish a dozen international and domestic war crimes and piracy tribunals. Its members have testified before Congress, and its reports and briefs have been cited recently by the International Criminal Court. So first, let me welcome Greg Noon. When you think Greg Noon, think Harmon Rab, the lead character in the television series Jag. They even look a little bit alike. Well, he says he looks more like Tom Cruise. Greg is a retired Jag captain and former commanding officer of the Navy's International and Operational Law Unit. He is currently an adjunct professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, director of the National Security and Intelligence Program at Fairmont State University, and he serves as the executive director of the Public International Law and Policy Group. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. And just for the record, I'm taller than Tom Cruise. <laughs> Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Sandy Hodgkinson. Sandy has served in high-level positions in the State Department and the Department of Defense, including as Deputy of the War Crimes Office at the State Department, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs, and Senior Advisor of the Coalition Provisional Authority in Baghdad, Iraq. Sandy is currently Senior Vice President at Leonardo DRS, the subsidiary of the European-based Defense and Aerospace Conglomerate, and she's also a Senior Fellow at Public International Law and Policy Group. Welcome, Sandy. Thanks so much, Michael. I'm excited to be here today. And I'm also happy to introduce Darren Johnson, Professor of Law at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Darren served as legal advisor to the U.S. Embassy in Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein, and then he was chief of staff for the Office of Special Coordinator of Middle East Transitions during the Arab Spring uprisings. Darren is also a senior, senior legal advisor at the Public International Law and Policy Group. Welcome, Darren. Thanks, Michael. Pleasure to be here. 
And rounding out our panel of adventurers is Professor Malena Stereo, who has been a regular on this show. Malena is a chaired professor at Cleveland State's Marshall College of Law, and she is the managing director of the Public International Law and Policy Group. It's so good to have you back. It's great to be back, Michael. So the television series Blood and Treasure is known for its exotic settings around the world. One of the best parts of being a real-life international lawyer is the travel. In my work, I've visited the temples of Angkor Wat, the ancient rock-cut cities of Petra. I've ridden on a stallion around the Great Pyramids of Giza, and I even whitewater rafted down the Nile near Lake Victoria. Let's turn to Greg Noon to tell us all about some of the exciting things he's done and seen in his work travels. Greg? Yeah, thank you, Michael. You know, at, at risk of sounding like we're all trying to top each other with the amazing things that we've been able to experience. And I know some of my colleagues, Sandy in particular, has done some of the same things I have. But but truly, uh, it's been remarkable. Uh, sitting with the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, uh, riding a camel in the Sahara at sunrise in Timbuktu, literally Timbuktu, definitely the first kid on my block to get there. Um, seeing seeing tortoises that are 150 years old that were born during the American Civil War in Mauritius, um, it, it just just remarkable. But more poignantly, being able to visit Nelson Mandela's cell on Robben Island and and uh, standing in the Valley of Death in the Crimea with the Light Brigade faithfully charged, uh, and, and lastly witnessing the mothers of the disappeared protest in the Plaza de Mayo in Buenos Aires. Uh, so it's really been a full range of of, of exotic and, and poignant and important uh, experiences. Yeah, and the key is that you don't go on vacations. Uh, you might stick a vacation in at the end, but you're all there on someone else's dime doing international law work. Right, Greg? Uh, no, 100%. Uh, my dad always marveled at the fact that I was able to get someone else to pay for my world travels. So, Darren, during your work in Rwanda, you got to see the Genocide Museum and Hotel Rwanda. Can you tell us about that experience? Uh, yes, Michael. You know, it was, a, it was a really powerful experience. I was in Kigali for one of PILPG's programs. We were essentially training a group of young African leaders uh, from about 10 different countries on transitional justice and how they could really take uh, these lessons in transitional justice back to their own home countries that were experiencing you know, ongoing civil conflict. And what was so powerful about this experience was actually being there with these young, you know, early 20s leaders and hearing from Rwandans themselves about the genocide and about how they had um, worked to reconcile beyond those divisions. It, it was really powerful. Um, and it, it, Darren, you know, did, did Hotel Rwanda look a lot like it did in the movie? You know, it, it, it didn't only because uh, when you got to Hotel Rwanda, you know, we were able to tour the outside. We weren't able to go inside, right? So we weren't able to, to quite see it in the same way uh, that it appeared in the film, but just being there and, and hearing the stories uh, that had been experienced, you, you still really felt like you were, you were part of that history. Sandy, what's your favorite travel adventure? Well, like my colleagues here, I've visited a lot of the war crime sites and locations, uh, both for pleasure and on uh, for work. But uh, one of the highlights... Only an international lawyer could say that they visited <laughs> a war crime site for pleasure. <laughs> yes, um, but I have enjoyed also some of the other sites, some biblical sites, including being able to witness Nineveh and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon during my time in Iraq. Um, I think a, a highlight for me in Lebanon was being able to go skiing at the Cedars. Um, I was provided a security detail for that skiing trip, but unfortunately they had a lot of trouble keeping up. So I think I was actually at greater risk because I had to keep stopping to wait for them on the slopes. But it was truly a beautiful, remarkable place to visit. Melina, what's yours? Uh, there are definitely several. One that comes to mind is I, I spent six months in Baku, Azerbaijan as a Fulbright scholar. And as part of our stay there, we got to see these oil platforms in the um, um, in the Caspian Sea that were featured in a James Bond movie um, some, some years before that. And then also I would add to that visiting some of the ancient Roman ruins in Jordan where I was participating as part of a PILPG training pro program. We were training Yemeni lawyers and I got to go around and see Petra, but also some of the most um, memorable Roman ruins. 
So become an international lawyer, see the world. But you know what? The most rewarding aspect of being an international lawyer is the high impact work that you all do. Let me ask each of our panelists to tell us about the most important project that they ever worked on. And I'm going to begin with Sandy. Sandy, you were the senior advisor on human rights for the U.S. government in Iraq right after the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003. Tell us about your work there. So my time working with the Iraqi people was really one of the highlights of my career. It was the most meaningful work I got to participate in, and, and it really sort of drove the direction of my career. Um, I traveled over in the very beginning of the conflict just prior to stay with General Jay Garner and his team in Kuwait in advance, and then we came in right when uh, Saddam Hussein fell. Um, and helped establish the new Iraqi government there. My role in all of that was really to help drive a culture of human rights and to address the atrocities that had occurred under the prior regime of Saddam Hussein. Um, so when I first came in, I got to start working with local NGOs on the ground on establishing new culture for human rights and a human rights ministry as part of the new government. Um, as time went on, I was also able to work with them on establishing mechanisms for accountability for the atrocities under Saddam's regime. Um, and that was extremely meaningful because uh, they were seeking a domestic tribunal under Iraqi law to try him for his war crimes. So for me, I got the opportunity to work with the new Iraqi government on helping set that up and help see the process through, through the collection of evidence and the ultimate preparation for the trial process. Um, but this to me was a highlight of my career um, and getting to work with them and helping them move beyond what they had suffered and try to create a, a country that really respected the fundamental rights in human rights and human rights law. I'm going to turn next to Greg, who recently led the Public International Law and Policy Group's team that documented the Rohingya genocide by interviewing over a thousand survivors in Cox Bazar, Bangladesh. Greg, can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, it, it, was, a, it was an amazing experience. We had a tremendous team. Uh, we went into the refugee camps and we did a, undertook this, uh, this survey of, of interviews, random interviews that we did. Basically, the Rohingya chased out of their home country, Myanmar, Burma, as many may know it, and um, and, and suffered at the hands of not only the uh, the, the national military but also um, some militias and as well as some people just joining in. So it, it was really one of the most uh, depraved uh, 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 stories I had ever heard. Uh, uh, forgive me for sounding like a. Uh, a bit of a sociopath that I, I I'm used to hearing about. They surrounded the village. They they killed some men. They raped some women and burned down the village. But but what they did was they went to the next level. They were dismembering people. They were they were uh, you know taking babies out of the arms of mothers and throwing them into the fire or throwing them into the river. Um, and in one just horrific story, they they made one man select which woman would be raped by all the soldiers in front of the rest of the village. So just really, like I said, a level of depravity that that just really kind of shakes you to your core. But ultimately, you know, by collecting this, you're going to be able to let the world know what happened there. So being an international lawyer is not for the faint of heart. It's time for a short station break. When we return, we're going to talk about some of the things that went wrong during the panelists' work in some of the most dangerous parts of the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy, brought to you by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Ideastream. I'm Michael Scharf, Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. I'm talking today with four international lawyers whose adventures around the globe may have helped inspire the hit television series Blood and Treasure, produced by our friend Mark Vlasich. We're getting to the most interesting part of the discussion times when things didn't quite go as expected. In every good action adventure, there's always a moment when everything goes wrong. So it is in real life. Let me begin with Darren Johnson. Darren is legal advisor 
to the U.S. Embassy in Iraq, you literally landed in Baghdad the day Saddam Hussein was executed. Instead of a somber affair, cell phone video captured the guards mocking Saddam and celebrating as he was led to the gallows. And a few minutes later, when Saddam's brother Barzan was hanged, his head was torn from his body. You've told me that your first assignment in Iraq was damage control regarding these botched executions. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely, Michael. It was, uh, you know, a memorable moment to say the least. Uh, I was a young State Department lawyer. This was my first overseas assignment, and I landed in the country to just this uh, this major crisis. Um, you know, as Sandy had mentioned before, the the effort to stand up this domestic tribunal was to was with the goal of bringing about justice for Saddam's crimes. And in just that moment, with this botched execution and and with it being recorded, um, it really undermined that effort and uh, risked turning the whole tribunal into this caricature of retributive uh, retribution. And so what we had to do behind the scenes was there was a lot of um, negotiation and discussions with the Iraqi government to really pause um, their implementation of the death penalty, to make sure that the procedures were in place to ensure um, that there was no recording of, um, of any further executions, and certainly to ensure that uh, to the extent that they were carrying out executions, that they, they were carried out in a manner that was, was just not uh, as horrendous as uh, the incident with Barzan. So it was certainly trial by fire for a young uh, international lawyer and, a, and definitely a memorable moment. So next, let me turn to Sandy Hodgkinson. Sandy, when you were Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs during the Bush administration, you managed to all but empty the notorious Guantanamo Bay Detention Center by convincing countries to take custody of their citizen detainees. But instead of celebrating your successes, you were called to Congress to testify when some of the repatriated detainees returned to the battlefield and attacked U.S. personnel. What was that like for you? Well, a key lesson here is that the decision-making process on international law and policy matters is very complex and multifaceted. And as a result, it can get very emotional when different perspectives are brought to the table. Here, the situation was we needed to balance between the need to protect against these very dangerous individuals that had been encountered on the battlefield and the stronger desire to close Guantanamo at the same time. And in trying to balance those, you know, we carefully constructed a situation where we would negotiate the transfer of individuals from Guantanamo with their host nations back to their home countries, but only provided they gave us assurances that those individuals would not be able to come back and fight us in the future. Um, but not every circumstance did the countries ultimately either honor those promises or were they able to necessarily keep them. And so in the balance of trying to close down the numbers at Guantanamo Bay, obviously we had to, you know, we had to trust our allies and our partners in trying to reach that goal. Um, People fell on different sides of the debate as to whether or not you should actually continue to detain these individuals at Guantanamo Bay um, or whether you should ultimately try to close Guantanamo. But here is just a clear example of, of the, the real challenge between balancing that need for security and safety and also trying to do the right thing. Yeah, international law and diplomacy is full of stories of unintended consequences. Melina Stereo, while you were assisting with piracy prosecutions in the Seychelles and Mauritius, you learned that the Western approach known as catch and release had the unintended consequences of encouraging the recruitment and use of childs, of children as pirates. You were then invited to speak about the challenges of combating child piracy at the UN Working Group in Copenhagen. What was your advice to the UN and what did we learn from that? Sure. So bo both Michael, you and I had the uh, privilege of working with prosecutors and judges in the Seychelles and Mauritius, and they told us that if they had uh, suspects, detainees who were under the age of 18, that their first reflex was just to say, we're going to stay away from this. This is just too complicated. We don't want to prosecute them. And so when we spoke to the UN, our advice to the UN was that it was crucial not to have a catch and release policy when it comes to the capture of uh, juvenile 
juvenile piracy suspects, but instead that it was key to train those judges and prosecutors on appropriate international human rights standards that apply to the detention and prosecution of juvenile suspects. Under international human rights law, juveniles can be prosecuted, but they have to be detained in separate facilities. They have to be provided with educational opportunities, and their sentences should reflect their young age. And didn't you also recommend that when adult pirates were being prosecuted, that it should be an aggravating factor in sentencing if they went out to sea with children? Absolutely. As at, at the beginning of some of these prosecutions, there was a tendency to prosecute the entire group of piracy suspects together, including juveniles and the ringleaders. And our advice there was to say, no, 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 that's not right. The ringleaders should actually uh, receive harsher penalties because they recruited and used child soldiers, soldiers, child pirates. So we were talking about Malena's experience in the Seychelles Islands and Mauritius, which are, are both in the Indian Ocean. In Blood and Treasure, the TV series, our protagonists stay at luxurious hotels in beautiful cities. And it's not all about tents and sleeping bags, I guess, for real life international lawyers either. Malena, tell us about your accommodations and the amenities in Mauritius. Sure, Michael. Now, I definitely have stayed in places that were not so nice, but in Mauritius, it was literally the opposite. Um, we stayed at a luxurious resort with lots of water sports, a spa, a wonderful restaurant. And to be totally honest, yes, it was nice after a full day of work talking about human rights standards, talking about you know children. It was nice to go back to this luxurious hotel and, and unwind. Best advertisement ever for going to law school. <laughs> yes. Well, let's contrast that experience with the experience that Greg and Sandy had in Cote d'Ivoire. I've heard about this, and, and you guys are not going to believe some of this. Go ahead. Who wants to start, Greg or Sandy? Well, well I, first, I, I just say we were, we were there after the electoral violence and, and working transitional justice. So Sandy and I were flying around compliments of the U.N. around the country, and this one particular hotel looked like it was right out of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride uh, in, in Disney World. Um, and, and that night that we stayed there, um, it, it rained like I've never seen rain ever before. I mean, th this rained just a absolutely deluge for four straight hours. It was amazing. I, I, my room was in the lee of the building. There's this beautiful like misting rain coming in as as this rain in, in Africa. The song was going through my head. <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, uh, Sandy, what was your experience in that same hotel? Well, I do recall that Greg woke up all refreshed the next morning bragging about the great night's sleep he had while I was actually up all night long because it was so creaky. I was scared. Um, but it was also partly because we had a, uh, a meal just before we went into the hotel. Uh, the only place that they had where you could eat, you would watch them take the plate of the customer before you, dunk it in a bucket of brown murky water, and then put your chicken on it and hand it to you. So after our fine meal, we did go back to the Pirates of the Caribbean Hotel. <laughs> it was truly frightening. You know, and sometimes... Um, and, 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 I, and I'll just say this, Michael, the roof was like a corrugated tin roof that sounded like it was going to blow off. <laughs> And so what Sandy's leaving out is that she put her running sneakers on and was ready to launch at, at, the, at any given minute when the roof finally blew off. I think Whereas she I did get a wonderful night's sleep. I think she mentioned to me that she literally slept standing up that night. Is that right, Sandy? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, and sometimes the situation outside the premises is so dire that international lawyers have to be locked down inside for their safety. Darren, tell us about your experience during the Juba peace negotiations in 2019-2020. Absolutely, Michael. Well, you know, as part of uh, PLPG's delegation, I was uh, one of the negotiate or one of the lawyers supporting the negotiations uh, between uh, different Sudanese parties, which South Sudan was hosting. And so, even though South Sudan was hosting these peace negotiations for its neighbor. South Sudan itself was also in the midst of its own very active and very violent civil conflict. So as we traveled into the country, right, we were, we had our own security, we were under a very tight curfew, you know, and at one point during the negotiations, we were actually locked down on our compound because there was very actionable um, intelligence that surfaced that terrorist groups were about to target expat sites. So essentially all of the locations where um, expatriates and international uh, lawyers such as ourselves were staying, 
uh, were subject to attack. And so um, fortunately, our team took it very seriously. We were locked down for a period of time, uh, but once uh, we moved past that period, we were, we were back at it. Michael, if I can jump in, I know that you yourself have been in the thick of things several times yourself. So tell us about the time that you were threatened by child soldiers at a checkpoint in Libya. Oh, oh, that's a good one. So we were in Libya to do transitional justice work, and we decided to go to Misrata, which was the height of the, the greatest fighting during the Libyan Civil War. And on the way there, there was a checkpoint manned by a child soldier who had machine guns wrapped around his neck. And the car in front of us, he stopped and he made the passenger seat passenger get out and he started bashing him with his machine guns. And then he let him get back in the car and he waved him forward. And then we pulled up and I was sitting in the passenger seat and he started yelling for me to get out. And I looked at pleadingly at the drivers, do something. So he starts speaking in Arabic and the child soldier started speaking back. And then he looked very disappointed and he waved us forward. So I said to the driver, what in the world did you do? You're a miracle worker. And he says, oh, no, you're just really lucky, professor. I happen to know his dad. And I told him if he beat you up, I was going to tell on him. So I, I, I dodged the bullet on that one. But yeah, you're, you're right. Sometimes things can get really hairy in the field. Yeah, you definitely lucked out on that one. But what about the time that you got um, tear gassed in Istanbul? Oh, I, I didn't miss the bullet <laughs> that time. So uh, we were there. We were training and working with Syrian judges for the future prosecution of the Assad regime. And that happened to be the day that the uh, college kids did a mass protest in Taksim Square in Istanbul. And we were about a mile away at a Starbucks talking with these Syrian judges. And all of a sudden, we heard chanting and yelling and, and a flood of, of people came into our square. And, and they had been the people who were protesting in Taksim. And they were subject to uh, tear gassing and rubber bullets and water cannons. And the next thing I know, we were subject to all of that. And so we started running with the protesters like one might run with the bulls at Papluma. Never ran so fast in my whole life. Um, we ended up peeling off and making it back to the hotel. And the next day we, we met with the Syrian judges and said, where did you guys go? We lost track of you. And they said, oh, when you ran away, professor, we ran toward the riot police. We picked up the tear gas and we threw it back at them. And I said, that's kind of dangerous. Why would you do that? And they said, because in our own country, Syria, when we protest, we get shot at with real bullets. They drop barrel bombs on us and they use chlorine gas against us. Tear gas is nothing. This was part of democracy. So that was their way of, of celebrating democracy very heroically. I guess all is relative, right? <laughs> so, you know, we were talking earlier about exotic travel, but you all have seen some horrible things, too, during your work excursions. Greg, tell us about your experience when you visited the massacre sites in Rwanda just after the 1994 genocide. Yeah, it was, it was really something. We, uh, I was part of a team that was training the 39 surviving prosecutors so they could do the domestic prosecutions of the genocide. And, and there was already talk about how uh, not that many people were killed and did it really happen, almost, a, almost on the level of a Holocaust denial. And so what they had done at this one particular site where about 3,000 people were killed, uh, it was a, at, a, at a school, they exhumed all the bodies that were that had kind of been all just shoved in a pit. And then they laid all the bodies out in the school rooms, uh, the classrooms, uh, and, and covered them in lime. And then on the door, they wrote the number of bodies that were in each room. And they, and they brought us there because they wanted internationals to see this with their own eyes so that they could kind of do the math and, and look at these 3,000 exhumed bodies and know how big the village was and kind of extrapolate. And, and that's how you get to 800,000. Uh, I, I can tell you, I'll never get that smell of lime uh, out, of my, out of my nose. It, I can still smell it today. Here's what I'm convinced. Milena gets all the really good excursions and Greg gets the really difficult ones. Let's ask Sandy, what, what's the most difficult things that you saw during your work? 
think perhaps the most heart-wrenching experience I had was uh, not dissimilar from what Greg just described, but this was immediately after the fall of Saddam Hussein, when local communities down in the Hala central area of Iraq, just south of Baghdad, began digging up all of the mass graves there, looking for their loved ones who'd gone missing under his regime, and most specifically in the 1991 Shia uprising. So they had all come out and were looking for all of their loved ones. There were mothers, grandmothers, parents, fathers, brothers, sisters, all just digging up the earth with their bare hands, wailing and crying and just looking for any item to help identify them of their loved one, a piece of clothing, a personal effect or something so that they could have, you know, a confirmation that they were in fact deceased because they'd been missing and also to offer them a proper burial. And so like Greg, you know, the memory of that will just stay with me forever as they, you know, tried to reconcile that and we tried to offer our assistance in how to get them through this process. Oh, that really is heart-wrenching. Darren, what what about you? Yeah, Michael, I'd say the most heart-wrenching experience was, um, again, when I was serving in Baghdad and and there was an incident where uh, contractors ended up um, essentially killing over a dozen uh, uh, civilians in Nisra Square, you know, and I was part of a team of uh, embassy officials uh, that was responsible for meeting with the family members. And so I just remember spending, you know, days sitting in a tent, um, meeting with family members, discussing what had happened. And it was probably one of the most uh, personally heart-wrenching experiences uh, that I've gone through. And you've also, Darren, helped advise Iraqi human rights defenders documenting the abuses of ISIS. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely, Michael. So, so not long after um, ISIS was uh, defeated in large part in Iraq, um, PILPG was able to return to the country. We hadn't been able to, to get into the country uh, for quite some time because of the conflict. And so we, were, we worked with a, a, this coalition of human rights defenders um, from around the country who themselves had taken on the responsibility of documenting the abuses of ISIS to try to um, bring some accountability and some um, reparation to family members who had been impacted by it. Really difficult work, but but really heroic um, Iraqi citizens engaged in that effort. So it's time for another short break. When we return, I'm going to ask our experts about times when cultural differences led to, quote, lost in translation type situations. Back in just a minute. This is Michael Scharf, and we're back with Talking Foreign Policy. I'm joined today by four international lawyers whose adventures may have helped inspire the television series Blood and Treasure. In this final segment, we're going to be talking about times when things went wrong because of cultural misunderstandings. Well, Michael, why don't you actually kick us off by telling the story that appears in your book, Enemy of the State, of when you were about to tell the Iraqi judges that they should be like a pit bull about due process. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. (laughs) I learned a lesson there. So I was invited to help train the judges for the Saddam Hussein trial, and I was trying to convince them that they had to be really vigilant about due process because the whole world was watching them. So I said, you have to be like a pit bull when it comes to due process and fair trial rights. And my interpreter said, oh, Professor, I will not... Oh, he said, what is a pit bull? That's the first thing he said. I said, oh, a pit bull is this dog we have in the United States that bites the neck and won't let go. And I said... They need to be like that about due process. And he said, no, Professor, I will not say that about the pit bull. And I said, why? And he said, because in our country, the dog is a very evil creature. It's a dirty creature. And to even suggest that the judges must be like a dog, well, they would walk out of the room and never talk to you again. So I said, well, do you guys have 
tree frogs in those marsh Arab areas, you know, sticky frogs that won't let go. And he says, oh, we have many sticky frogs, Professor. I said, well, tell them they have to be like a sticky frog then. It wasn't quite the same analogy or metaphor, but it worked and, and they didn't leave the room. So, Malena, speaking of interpreters, why don't you tell us about the what the interpreters said to you when you were in Amman, Jordan, working with lawyers from Yemen as part of the peace negotiations? Sure. So I was in Amman, Jordan, as part of this public international law and policy group uh, peace negotiation that lasted for about five days. And it was in English and Arabic. Most of the Yemen lawyers um, did not speak English, so they were speaking Arabic. So there were interpreters there interpreting from English to Arabic and the other way around. And at the end of the first day, one of the interpreters came up to me very seriously and said, you know, we interpreters, we keep a hit list. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? And he said, a hit list of, of people who speak too fast. And he said, and right now you're number one on that list. So that was a, a good way of reminding me to just slow down because the interpreters were having a really hard time. When, whenever I speak at a conference with simultaneous interpretation, I always have a sign sitting in front of me at the dais that says, slow down for that reason. So, Sandy, being a woman in the field can have unique challenges in some foreign countries. Can You once told me that in Botswana, the local colonel that you were working with asked you if he could call you mama. Is that right? What did you say to him? I told him that lieutenant would be just fine. Well, are there other times when you ran into such gender challenges? So I found as a female officer, uh, you know, beginning out in the military in uniform and then separately as a diplomat when I worked for the State Department, I had a number of interesting encounters, um, not really challenges, but just interesting moments where, you know, we were trying to understand the, the awkwardness in how to handle, you know, a female and a male relationship in a foreign country. Um, and so there were a couple of them, you know, I felt like I was considered this sort of third gender because I'd been placed in a position of authority by the US government. I wasn't really male. I wasn't a local female by their standards. So I was a, sort of a different thing. Um, and so it seemed like I was this third gender and they would allow me then to be assertive in my positions and still earn respect kind of calls up a few memories that I had that were really special though. I know the first one was in Mauritania when I was there as the senior member of a delegation and was invited to a dinner at the local colonel's home. I was the only female seated around this incredible display of food, but it was all being served by the daughters and spouse of the colonel. So they kept peering out from the kitchen to watch me and giggling all night long because they couldn't believe there was actually a woman there. Um, I, I compare that to a time when I did three weeks peacekeeping trip in Abu Dhabi and every night the male officers were invited out to go out with members of the Emirati Armed Forces for dinners and events. And as a female, I was separately paired up with a different spouse for every night of the trip and would go to local markets to go shopping or have tea, but was kept completely by myself one spouse at a time. So I got to share so many stories about our cultural differences. I think I'll only mention one more because I, I, to this day, still think about this with such fondness. But I was visiting Beirut just prior to getting married, and the admiral there had heard about my engagement and threw this big engagement party for me at the officers club. And all of the male officers that I had worked with over the years, each individually gave me a beautiful gift, which was a makeup kit. So I ended up stuffing my suitcase coming home with like 55 different kinds of eyeshadows and lipsticks and perfumes to bring back uh, for me to get married with. So it was extremely endearing and, and I cherish some of those memories, but it definitely was, um, I was a different thing than what they were used to. And, and I do want to point out that Sandy now does have five wonderful children. And for the record, they're the only ones who get to call her mama. <laughs> so now... Phrases in different cultures sometimes mean something very different than their literal translation. Darren, did you ever experience that in your work in the Middle East? Uh, definitely, Michael. You know, one, one uh, kind of funny moment that I remember is when I served as a legal advisor for our embassy in Baghdad. One of my jobs was to regularly meet with, you know, high-level Iraqi officials. And oftentimes when you know, I would make a request of them or when, uh, you know, I had to deliver a particular message from the State Department, 
I would receive a, me a response of, you know, inshallah, or God willing. And, you know, that, that usually sounds like a pretty positive response until I found out from some um, close uh, Iraqi friends that I made that oftentimes inshallah is just another way of saying, uh, don't bet on it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so in that moment, it, it showed me the importance of having uh, friends who are local c who can tell you what the, the terms really mean. I think I just learned something. You know, in different cultures, there are different conceptions of being on time. I know in U.S. sports, there's a saying that if you're early, you're on time. And if you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you better be running laps. But it's quite different abroad. To illustrate this, Malena, why don't you tell us about the time you had a 10 o'clock meeting with the dean of Novi Sad Law School in Serbia, and you showed up a couple of minutes early. Yeah, so I showed up at around 9.55 thinking, you know, I'm, I'm early. You know, I'm, I'm not running laps. You know, I'm, I'm early. Um, and when I showed up and, and checked in with the dean's secretary, she literally looked at me as if I were completely crazy. And I said, no, 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 I'm here for the 10 o'clock meeting. And she was like, yeah, but it's like 9.57. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, but, you know, he's not going to be available or, you know, it doesn't really start until, you know, 10.30 or 10.40. So there was a totally different, um, you know, conception of time. And the other thing that I can mention on this, I'm sure Darren would agree, for example, in Juba, South Sudan, where both of us have st spent time for peace negotiations, after a few days there, my, you know, sort of Western colleagues and I started saying things like, oh, does this really start at 10 a.m. normal time or 10 a.m. Juba time? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, food can be a big challenge, too. Uh, monkey brains in parts of Africa, snake soup in China, sheep's head in Norway, fat bottomed ants in Colombia, guinea pigs in Peru, crocodile skewers in Australia. They're all foreign delicacies that have been offered to me while I've been working abroad. I remember once when I was in Libya, we had just finished a large midday feast with our hosts and my colleague, Paul Williams, who's often been on the show who was asked, or he asked the question, you know, what does camel taste like? And on our way back to the office after this feast, our host took a detour for a second lunch, this one at a restaurant with a large camel sign out front. But, you know, sometimes the shoe is on the other foot, and we have to remember that what we eat in the United States might seem a little odd to our foreign guests. Greg, tell us the story about the time you hosted a Rwandan delegation in Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So each night we would take turns bringing them out to dinner. And Newport Rhode Island, of course, has wonderful restaurants. Uh, the night before it was my turn, uh, one of our colleagues did a, a like a classic New England clam bake, right? And so you, you can imagine the whole the whole scene that they they put on for them. It was I, I thought how wonderful. I I would love to go to a New England clam bake. So the next night I'm taking them out, and I said, "Where would you like to eat?" And they kind of sheepishly looked around at each other and uh, finally said anything, but no more giant red scorpion. <laughs> so and, and, that's and what our lobsters to, are to them. <laughs> yeah, it, it took me a minute to realize they were talking about lobsters. And then I thought, you know, if I was in the middle of Africa and somebody put a big beetle on my plate and said, no, this is a delicacy. This costs a lot of money. And here, eat the back end first. <laughs> I, I think right. I'd have the same... I think I'd have the same reaction. So, uh, so yeah, so sometimes sometimes we miss the boat as well. Now, Michael, tell us the story about your meeting with the head of the Truth Commission in Côte d'Ivoire. Oh, yeah, Côte d'Ivoire, the same place that Sandy and Greg were, you know, at the Hotel in the Rain. I went there at the behest of the U.S. State Department to talk to the head of the Truth Commission who had reportedly decided that she was going to release the names of everybody who had been implicated by anybody who had testified before her commission, whether or not there was any corroboration or any evidence you know, that showed that there was really beyond reasonable doubt that these people were implicated. And the problem, of course, is once you're named in a Truth Commission report, it's like putting a target on you and, and people are going to attack you. So I had this very important assignment to go and convince her to keep those names secret and give them only to the prosecutor and have sort of an executive summary without the names. Now, I go there and I don't speak really good French. And in Cote d'Ivoire, that's all they speak. Now, I know Sandy speaks French really well and Melena's fluent in French, but not Greg and me, right, Greg? So when I was there, I said that I'd be using a translator. And all of a sudden, the Truth Commission judge got very angry and she started saying a lot of things in rapid French. And I heard her say, Newt Gingrich, 
and Mitt Romney. And this was very perplexing to me. So I turned to the translator. I said, what's going on? Well, apparently, this was during the primaries when Newt Gingrich and Mitt Romney were running against each other. And Newt Gingrich had a commercial that aired everywhere in the world through the beauty of uh, computers in which he was showing Mitt Romney speak in French at the Salt Lake City Olympics. And the voiceover, who was Mitt, uh, Newt Gingrich, said, that's Mitt Romney, and he speaks French too well to be a patriot. Someone who speaks French that well is unfit to be president. Vote Newt Gingrich. And that made this uh, French-speaking judge very angry. So I had to find a way to ex- extract myself from that. I noticed that she had some pictures of her kids playing soccer on her desk. So I started asking her questions about her kids to distract her. And then I I asked her if the kids knew about the important work that their mom was doing. And I said, because, you know, if, if you do not end up documenting these atrocities, your country is going to be condemned to repeat them over and over again. Now, of course, I I shamelessly was borrowing from George Santanyana, but she didn't seem to know that, and she thought that was pretty cool. So she asked if she could have her selfie taken with me, and and we worked things out. But yes, it's very important as an international lawyer sometimes to be able to speak the local language. Um, I want to end by asking each of our panelists why they became international lawyers. And I'll start with you, Melina. Sure. So I think for me, maybe it's a little bit personal. I grew up in what's now Serbia, the former Yugoslavia. And when I was coming of age, the country was falling apart. There was a civil war, lots of bad things happening. And I really saw firsthand the role that international lawyers can play in resolving conflicts, in you know coming to, a, to an agreement, leading the parties towards an agreement. And so from that point on, I decided this is, I, this is what, what I would like to be. This is what I would like to do. And hopefully I will someday make an impact in you know either my own country or somewhere else and you certainly have darren you're next well michael you know similar to melena i grew up with a deep reverence for the role that lawyers can play in improving society i grew up with this deep reverence for civil rights lawyers and i also had a passion for foreign affairs and so i found over time that a career in international law really allowed me to merge all of those passions a deep love of the law a deep love of foreign affairs and a deep love of human rights and it's been so, so rewarding. Greg, how about you? Well, I, I wish it was as deep as Darren's. I, I was a young single naval officer who just wanted to be stationed overseas. So I kind of fell into it quite by accident and then came back to Newport, Rhode Island and, and worked in a, a, a brand new program called the Defense Institute of International Legal Studies, which is a place that Sandy and I both worked. And um, we just got to do some amazing work from uh, all, all over the world, really, and, and, and really fell in love with the idea that we could practice law and help others practice law and, and really along the way help, um, help victims of, of some of the uh, most grave atrocities known to man. Sandy, what about you? So I was, uh, you know, I always had this passion for human rights and international law, even before there were classes in sort of this area. So as I was going through school, I was always interested and fascinated by the war crimes tribunals and how to address them. And um, even long before there was an international criminal court, I authored a big paper on why we should have an international criminal court, because I felt so strongly that there had to be justice mechanisms for accountability. And and I'll say that, you know, through this uh, opportunity to serve in this capacity as a lawyer over these decades, um, it has been everything I ever hoped it could be and more. So I've, I've loved every step of the career. And so finally, with our few minutes remaining, I'd love to ask each of you to tell us about what you're working on now and where you're going to be traveling next. Melina, do you want to kick things off? Sure. Um, I have lately. I have been very involved in the work of the Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, I just returned from a round of peace negotiations in Juba, South Sudan. So it's likely that I will return to Juba. We also have a potential visit scheduled in Khartoum, Sudan, where we work with the government of Sudan. And then we also have clients in Ukraine. So th- those are the destinations that are probably most likely in the near future. Darren, what about you? Yes, uh, uh, much like Milena, I've worked with um, PIOPG on the, the Sudan peace negotiations. And so right now I'm working on a team helping to focus on implementation of that agreement, also working on human rights documentation in Iraq and transitional justice in South Sudan. And so um, hopefully there will be opportunities to travel back to Juba, both in support of the Sudan peace negotiations 
and transitional justice issues in South Sudan. And Greg, where are you off to next? So I literally just returned from Amman, Jordan, where we're helping the Jordanian Armed Forces uh, create operational legal uh, support. So basically making international lawyers out of some of their uh, military lawyers so that they can better advise the commanders in the field, uh, and, and especially with their treatment of civilians, whether refugees or, or people in, uh, caught in between battle. Uh, that and with the Public International Law and Policy Group working with uh, uh, leading the Yemen team. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, there's never a dull moment when working with Yemen. Well, we've heard some fascinating tales from the field today. Don't be surprised if some of these show up in the next season of Blood and Treasure. Our producer is indicating that it's time to wrap up our program. Greg Noon, Sandy Hodgkinson, Darren Johnson, and Melena Stereo, thank you all for sharing your experiences with our listeners. Our audience will probably never think about international lawyers in the same way again. I'm Michael Scharf. You've been listening to Talking Foreign Policy. In 2019, CBS premiered Blood and Treasure. The hit television series was inspired by the real life adventures of international lawyers who hopscotch around the globe working on war crimes prosecutions, human rights cases, and peace negotiations. In the next Talking Foreign Policy, we'll talk to some actual adventurers and hear real life stories that may have helped inspire the hit show. Don't miss it.